um, well what I'm about to do right now is to cover the syllabus as far as possible and to make sure when you write the exam or when you sit for the exam that you will have at least four questions to write for from the areas we've covered right so that's the goal today that you might have a lot of questions on so I want you to ask those questions so I can clarify so it helps me also right having said that if you all prefer me speaking in Sinhala let me know because I can speak in Sinhala I can reiterate the same thing in Sinhala don't feel shy ask questions in Sinhala not a problem at all right um, okay so sorry um, right so what is your basic understanding of a contract what do you call a contract any idea no idea at all okay can I ask you a question now today morning when you came to law college how many agreements did you make or in other words how many contracts did you make for an example you get into the bus you purchase a ticket you make a contract on an agreement there now I'll, I'll make I'll show you the difference between an agreement and a contract huh? in a bit but for now we'll use these words alternatively when you walked into college today the security uncle let you walk through because of a contract he has right um, similarly I'm here because of an agreement I have now from these contracts and agreements certain things are legally enforceable right from these agreements that we've made for the past eight hours certain things are enforceable that makes it a contract for an example now today morning a uh, uh, couple of days ago they asked me the, whether I want to do a kupi I said okay if I don't turn up today at 12 o'clock now we made an agreement more or less right for them who came and asked me whether you want to do a kupi which and to which I replied and said yes so offer acceptance done if I do if I didn't turn up today at 12 o'clock could they have sued me there was an agreement formed no but they couldn't have sued me why because certain elements of a contract enforceability right form intention to create legal duty wasn't there it was an agreement that we made similarly say that you're going for a class and you pay like a hefty sum for it and uh, okay say that it's IELTS or whatever and the lecturer doesn't turn up can you sue the person you may or may not be able to why because at that particular point so it's more or less it's not a domestic or, a, an, or an agreement it's not an agreement because your body is no you get it it's an agreement based on his professional capacity so you may or may not be able to sue so that's the biggest difference you need to first of all understand right and hence why we learn contract law to make sure at each point of life why you study what you study that's basic number one principle you need to know why you study what you study okay so what is a contract according to CJ Biramantri you know who uh, uh, CJ Biramantri is right that's great a contract is a promise or promises mutually exchanged okay promise or promises mutually exchanged uh, setting up against the promisor or promisors so you know the one who makes the promise is a promisor the one who accepts the promise right or the one who on on who the promise is made on is the promisee similarly creditor debtor lessor lessee that's how it goes okay and setting up against a promise or promisors of duties of performance laws would recognize or enforce right now this definition I mean I taught the definition in a more practical sense with the examples so just write it down go home and sort of uh, understand it and you just have to re reproduce it when it's the exam right but just don't buy hard things understand why it is what it is right uh, for the promise or the promisee or a third party intended to be benefited okay let's keep that aside because that definition is just something you need to buy heart you need to reproduce after understanding what it means okay having said that now I differentiated between an agreement and a contract as well everyone's clear between an agreement and a contract no no one is unclear y'all are clear right is everyone clear not clear clear okay okay so first of all now for us to understand whether there was an intention to create legal duty for us to understand whether there was an offer or an acceptance we need to 
first of all see what the two parties agreed on what court of law would do is they would go i mean they would just tell both parties to come and they would explain whatever they agreed on and then the court of law would come into a conclusion now the now how they come into a conclusion is through an objective test right so there was this whole problem of whether it was objective or subjective at the onset of things right but having said that now usually what court looks at is the objective intention of the parties right irrespective of what i think irrespective of what you think say that the two of us are getting into a contract irrespective of what he personally thinks or what i personally thinks whatever the two of us came sat down discussed a reasonable person would have understood is what the court would infer from the contract between the two of us am i clear to you all okay hitanda mamai may i contract ekak thiyena hi the me contract ekak thiyena kota me a personally dewal hitanna pula mama personally dewal tiyak hitanna pula mage olu wenna dewal thiyenna pula e unata court of law natta usavikata giyama natta neetiya recognize karanne monawada api denna personally hitapu dewal neme api denna ape denna ge personal capacity ge gedara indan hitapu dewal hitanna all that matters is that api denna ta denna ta denna මේ කියන්නා වූ දේවල් හුවමාරු කරාද කියන එක. right? ඒක ඩිරයිව් කරන්නේ කොහොමද? reasonable person කෙනෙක්. third party එකක් who's reasonable with the same amount of information provided to both of us would come into that conclusion if that is the case the court would hold in that favor. right? Uh, so the case for that is now objective test is uh, Smith versus Hughes. right? so in this particular case what happened was there was a particular property was to be sold and uh, again take it's the two of us i am sending the property to him i send him a letter saying that the property is valued at $29000 right and he knows that, that that's on the market value right after now he accepts the said the letter and say okay fine $29000 sold oh, i will buy and later on i realize i made a mistake i write a letter to him saying look here it's a mistake so i cannot sell you the property right so what the court said was irrespective of what he knew he knew that it was not the market price $29000 at a at a very uh, you know premium uh, and an expensive land area he knew it was not the market price but irrespective of what he thought the court said $29000 is what it is right when he is when i said 29000 there's no way he could have inferred or he could have thought anything else objectively okay similarly there's a uh, so this is uh, what uh, blackburn justice blackburn said there's a principle called buyer be aware right so the buyer um yeah sorry uh, so this is that that's one of the cases then there's smith versus you now the 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 previous case was actually central venture estates versus May merchant investors assurance company if you want you can make a note of it because these cases i've taken from the college notes plus uh, university of london llb notes so there are certain cases uh, that might not be there i'm not sure but you can nevertheless rely on those because i did on in my exam and i think a lot of uh, y'all might be having colleagues who do their llb here no so ask from them they might also use it uh, these are cases from the llb uh, book as well so that the first case is centroventional estate versus uh, merchant investors assurance and the next case is smith versus hughes right so this is a case to do with oats what happened was now i have to feed my horse and apparently horses only eat uh, fresh oats or whatever right so what happened was then ani patte mata penna no fresh oats basket ekak fresh oats basket at the now i have no idea i don't now this he is the he is a seller i am the buyer he shows me a basket of fresh oats sorry he shows me a basket of old oats and says okay these are fresh oats this is at this price then mam bulk ekak gattama mata enne old oats and my horse won't eat old oats because they require fresh oats can i now go back on my contract the court said the buyer has to be aware he knew that he was you know not giving me fresh oats that is what i asked for irrespective of it right the buyer should have known and that's the objective thing that they look for right so two cases we learned smith versus hughes and centroventional estate if you can um in like a make a note uh this is you can do it at home actually k 
केस से का दान ना दें ही तो ना स्मिथ वर्सेस ही उसके ला स्मिथ वर्सेस ही उस जला इम्पोर्टेंट थ्री पॉइंट्स देखा क्यों ना देखा क्यों लकी ना इतना क्या ना देर आर टू इम्पोर्टेंट पॉइंट्स दैट यू नीड टू रिमेम्बर फॉर द एग्जाम पुट टू एंड सर्कल इट राइट व्हेन यू आर ट्रैवलिंग और व्हाट एवर मे बी यू कैन गो थ्रू द सो व्हाट यू विल हैव एट द एंड ऑफ द डे इज समथिंग लाइक दिस राइट एंड यू वुड हैव द एंटायर चैप्टर इन जस्ट टू पेजेस यू कैन यू कैन सॉर्ट ऑफ स्टडी इट ओवर एंड ओवर अगेन व्हेन यू आर ट्रैवलिंग और डूइंग व्हाट एवर यू वांट ओके सो मे बी लाइक यू गेट यूज्ड टू लाइक स्मॉल स्मॉल ट्रिक्स बिकॉज स्पेशली फर्स्ट ईयर गाइस यू विल हैव अबाउट 200 केसेस पर सब्जेक्ट एरिया राइट or rather sometimes in certain cases per chapter you might have that much of cases and sometimes you feel like it's in humanly impossible to remember all of it right the best way is to have a note like this so where you when you're traveling or when you're doing something you get to revise it over and over again and it becomes muscle memory simple as that right but again do not buy hard things huh? it's all about uh, knowing your things and then being able to sort of jot it down from your memory that's all law means um right okay having said that now we'll move on to the subjective test now subjective test according to so what they look for is the true intent of the parties okay they look for the true intent of the parties in the sense now say that um so the, i i will explain that through a case so hartag versus collins right the case There was a small problem between hemp and tar, right? So hemp and tar coming from one ship called the SL, okay? So one of these products was more expensive than the other, and a person at an auction or uh, gave uh, bids for this expensive product, right? And what happened was, now the seller knew, now now she was or he was thinking. that he was bidding for the expensive product but in fact he was bidding for something less expensive but nevertheless he quoted that expensive price thinking that it was that particular product right you're following me yeah then what happened was uh, now the seller knew that this guy was misun he was mistaken as to the subject matter as to what exact product he was bidding on but the seller didn't care why because he is getting money out of it they went to court and he said look here i didn't know i was thinking that it's something you know more expensive hence why i quoted that price but to see it's something else this contract is cannot cannot happen and then the and then the other guy came and said no you have to look at it objectively right irrespective of what i had in mind or he had in mind what was communicated is all that matters at that particular point the court said no right the the negligence of or rather the mistake of the buyer mistake of the person has occurred because of your negligence right so in an instance like that if you look at it objectively and hold it in favor of you what will happen is it will be unfair because why you knew all along what was happening you knew all along and you orchestrated this entire thing so at that at that particular point they look at the subjective intention right so small clarification now the court looks at the objective plus the subjective on a case by case basis right they don't stick to one particular stand point they don't stick to one particular view point they look at it on a case by case basis so it's important to know that and in certain in most cases i would say it's objectively looked at unless of course you know it's unless of course not looking at it object or subjectively would be detrimental to one of the parties okay so what are okay now that is done so now subjective and objective usually there's a question right uh have you all gone through the past paper of the previous year you all haven't have you all? no great that's okay that's okay i mean contract if i'm not mistaken i started within one and a half days or so but i would suggest you all to start before because it's a lot of pressure and you know now that the papers are also tough it's always important that you start before right uh, just go through the past papers and see so usually subject and objective test you mean one and a half days or week this this one and a half weeks my god you have time to study all eight subjects <laughs> this um so usually the first question is the subjective and the objective test so go through this you have to be very logical when you're answering there's no point of you reproducing whatever the lecturer gave you the lecturer gives you a note 
and questions you on it thinking that you will you know be very analytical logical and critical they also lawyers you know there's no point of you producing the answer there be very logical and also in law there's no right or wrong answer it's all about how you support it right a particular problem question you might think of it in a different way she might think of it in a completely different way so long as you support it with your right cases with your right argumentation you're good to go okay i mean just having said that don't put like you know nuanced answers you get what i mean no? <laughs> make sure that you know it's relevant but then again uh, support it uh, with like good case law right so what are the elements of a contract you're still not going to talk i'm not going to continue if you alone talk so what are the elements of a contract sorry agreement offer acceptance great uh, there has to be an intention right uh, right then there has to be form there has to be uh, intention to enter into an agreement plus an intention to create legal duties there we go also the capacity of the parties it's important that the parties are not you know minors and la di la di la okay right now we come to the uh yeah so the important part my favorite part it's about offer right so usually uh, if i'm not mistaken again guys subjective and objective test one question will be there then there'll be a question on offer then there will be a question so offer acceptance consideration all three together you might be able to do about three and a half four questions again you need to revise revisit the past papers and see because this is me speaking when i did my paper like year before last i sat in 2017 so again i might have not you know know the exact thing as you all do now okay right so offer and acceptance what is an offer what is an offer okay so again going back to that note i told you all offer kela danna right offer kela uh three things kela mema irak gahala tuna kela da right offer is an expression of willingness what is an offer it's an expression of willingness i express my willingness to contract with you right expression of willingness that is bind that is binding upon acceptance i express my willingness to contract with her and then and i'll be bound if she says yes simple as that okay so two things not three sorry two elements expression of willingness to be bound upon acceptance right so the two cases are sora versus manchester city council gibson versus manchester city council right from these two cases only you need to show what offer means now i'll explain the cases also right okay so in one case that is uh, the case of storer what happens is there is um, a guy who wants to simply purchase a town house right and then he sees an advertisement on the newspaper <laughs> and the advertisement says if you are willing to or if you are interested in buying a town house or whatever just send us an application or what right which he does he sends a very basic application after sending the basic application they call him up and they he they say if you if you are willing to purchase this send us a formal application we may be prepared we may be prepared to sell the house to you within like quoted may may is very important because it's very indecisive they don't make a commitment do they they don't say i will sell the house no that's on gibson does gibson says you send us a, a application and we will i mean if I, we will sell you the house so in these both these cases the town clerk ultimately doesn't sign but the court held in the case of storer because they used the more uh, not sure term in to, to put it in very basic layman language saying that may may is very indecisive it doesn't make a definite commitment because of it what happens is what does what happens it's not an offer right they say it's not an offer but in the case of gibson they say because they said we will sell you the house if you make an application then it's an offer and if had so all that gibson had to do was 
to send that application because they said that if you send the application we will accept right so one case it was held to be an offer in a different case it was not held to be an offer right so these two cases are important okay okay all right so you need to see the difference between an offer right statement of invita intention invitation to treat plus a supply of information right so statement of intention invitation to treat or a supply of information would not constitute an offer it's an expression of willingness uh, that is specially bound upon acceptance if you accept it just because you say yes to it doesn't mean it is accepted because it's not capable of being accepted why it's indefinite i'll explain step by step right is everyone with me so far yeah no am i too fast no okay can you hear me yeah, yeah. all right okay right so the first thing is um okay so the first case is the, uh, harris versus nickerson right statement of intention we're talking of a statement of intention now what happens in this case of harris versus nickerson is that there was so a particular person put up certain articles of furniture for an auction up for an auction right and then this other guy went miles and miles just to buy a particular piece of furniture okay and when he got there the auctioneer had pulled off that particular article from the list of furniture that was to be auctioned right he had pulled it off so sitana ekenan dahai menakan articles dahayat tiyena kiyala ha seventh article leka ya auction ekata dan na he probably had second thoughts about it or whatever but now this guy had traveled miles just to buy this piece of furniture and he went and said look here the moment he put up um the the the, the very fact that he put up an advertisement or rather something on the paper saying that there is going to be an auction like this amounts to an offer and i accepted it when i got there and the court said no that that's not how it happens why because had it been the case everybody who got there everybody who got to that particular place looking for that article would be entitled to that particular article so that's just one article hame kena da nahi ta almari ak kela ek almari ak tiyena just because you got there e almari mara daha ekata denna bae ne there's one there's only one almari right so he says that's not an offer because if if it's an offer he'll be bound to give it you can't make that offer to 10 different people right so he says look here it's just a statement of intention and then uh, the second case is uh, supply of information right the case is harvey versus facey now what happens in this case is so this case is due with bumper hall pens now i think this guy has a bumper hall pen or 10 of it i don't know uh, what happens is um, so he is prepared to sell it for 1000 rupees right once he's prepared to sell for 1000 rupees she asked me what can i no what is the lowest price you're willing to sell this for or what's the lowest you can go for right and then he says 900 is the lowest right and he she doesn't communicate back to me she thinks that she, that, that there is an agreement or there's an there's a contract right so court said no there is no agreement there's no contract i merely supplied information what's the lowest price you can give this for 900 rupees right says so harvey versus facey and then there is the third concept that is an invitation to treat so an invitation to treat uh, would again be divided into a display of goods advertisement um, request for tenders and auctioneer's request request for bid so invitation of treat now okay so offer is there we learn the concept of offer there are two cases to support the concept of offer right and then we differentiated offer from a supply of information from an invitation to treat uh plus a uh sorry from invitation to treat statement of information statement of uh, intention and supply of information we differentiate an offer with those three and now invitation to treat is again divided into four right uh i don't have a marker but if i did have a marker you understand you can draw a dichotomous key right you can draw like a small diagram which will make your lives much easier 
Right, so invitation to treat, as I said, display of goods. Um, auctioneer's request for auctioneer's request for bids, ten, and then the whole tender issue is there. Then advertisements. All these four elements are there. Right? So we'll go again case by case. Are you all following me so far? Yeah? Okay. Right. So display of goods. The case is pharmaceutical societies versus boots. Right? So what happens is, um, I, if I remember the act correctly, so there's this UK act. Uh, call the something to do with medicine right so you can't so technically even in Sri Lanka you can't be selling medicine without a prescription right unless of course it's Panadol or whatever there are certain medicine that requires a prescription so in this particular pharmacy uh, or the supermarket what happened was there were certain elements or there were certain tablets on a shelf right so a particular so the the I think the borough council or whatever went and complained and said they are making offers or they are issuing medicine without a prescription or without a reputed pharmacist now the system of this supermarket is that there's a shelf you pick it up right and you walk to the cashier the, at the cashier there will be a pharmacist right so they say uh, you having the or rather the Tablets being on display does not amount to an offer, right? The offer is when the customer goes, fetches the tablets from the display, walks to the cashier and gives it to the cashier, right? At that particular point, it's accepted by the pharmacist, okay? So they're not making an offer there, right? Um, then... Okay, so there is a case, there is a particular case, but I checked, um, it was not in the eye guide. I'm not sure whether madam gave it to you all. Thornton versus Shul and Parking. Give or, gave or, did she give? No. Okay, so just, just so you all understand the whole concept. Right, so Thornton versus Shul and Parking is a case law to argue against this position. Right, this is a UK case law again. If you all have done, if if you all have uh, sat for your first year of the LLB, you would know this case. So what happens here is that um, so there is a there is an automated parking lot, right? Uh, so in here, ah, mummy, to buy I'm so sorry, guys. I have to uh, finish in like five minutes. Uh, really sorry about it. So I'll just so Thornton versus Shul in parking. You all go Google it because Madam hasn't given. I mean, no point of me discussing, no. Um, and also, like also, whatever Madam gives is like the note. Huh? That's like authority that you need to study. Whatever that is that you gather from this uh, I guide or pro studies or whatever, make sure that that's your supplementary reading. Cause I mean, she knows best, right? Uh, okay, so there's also the, the second element is advertisements. So Partridge versus Cretendon is again the case law for it. There's a particular, you know, the species of birds called the bamboo finchcock, right? So bamboo finchcock is very, I think, um, is very rare or whatever. And there were about 10 um, birds there. And then this guy put up an advertisement and said, whoever who wants to purchase bamboo finchcock, please come. And there were about like 20 people or more. And the court held that was never an offer because again the same, same rationale as in the case of uh, pharmaceutical of uh, sorry not pharmaceutical societies Harris versus Nickerson to say that had it been an offer everyone who would have come to that particular place should have gotten uh, a bird and it's impossible for the vendor to provide or to to cater to such an uh, demand right okay then the next case is. Uh, Okay, so a unilateral contract is different, guys. The case is Carlyle versus Carbolic Smoke Balls. The reason is uh, because uh, an advertisement itself is an offer because he cannot or the company cannot go to each an individual and make offers individually, right? So such an offer is, is um, accepted the moment you perform it. So if it's a smoke ball, what happened was, you all know the case facts, no? Should I go through it? No. No, okay. Uh, right. And then we move on to the request for tenders. So the case is Havela Instruments versus Royal Trust. Um, so technically in a tender, it's just an offer. Um, uh, sorry, it's not an offer. It's just an invitation to treat, right? But there is a, a different case law to say that um, 
if it's if there is implied undertaking right implied undertaking in the sense you say that uh, if you give me the highest bid i will give it to you right so say that the three of you all bid you give the highest bid even if i don't like you i need to give it to you right if there's implied undertaking it's an offer and that's an offer which is bound upon the moment you give me the highest bid right uh, then there is the case of uh, or the element of auctioneer's request for bids that also same thing the moment the auctioneer puts a gavel down or bangs a gavel that's that's when um, the offer which is given by you is accepted by the auctioneer so the auctioneer doesn't give an offer you who goes for the auction bids for a particular price and that is accepted um let's quickly skim through everything now okay so that's an offer we spoke of then there is this concept of cross offer right now example say that you ask me right you ask me this piece of paper is worth 100 rupees right you ask me i am willing to purchase this for 100 rupees are you willing right and at that particular point i say i will give it to you 90 are you willing to buy that's a cross offer right it's a cross offer and it's important for you to understand the difference between an offer and a cross offer right there's also this concept of a count offer right so count offer what would happen is it would take off or rather kill the original offer a count offer would kill the original offer right cross offer is both parties you know offer right and it could be i mean see if if now i also offer he also offers if he accepts then it's my cross offer that is accepted by him right in a count offer the original offer is killed okay so what is acceptance guys then we'll move on to acceptance our offer is sorted no make a dichotomous key put down the cases put down the important areas also go through the case facts it's very important that you go through the case facts and just remember the case facts the moment you remember the case facts you can argue on that right acceptance so acceptance is unqualified assent to all of the terms of the offer Exa again the paper example i'm willing to sell this for 100 rupees white color paper and written on it is blue ink right then this one comes and says yeah i am willing to buy it for 100 rupees white color paper with black ink that's that's not unqualified assent right there's a conditional requirement there so that would not amount to acceptance right for acceptance simply for me saying i mean simply if he says yes that is enough okay right so it's a mirror image of the offer so acceptance could be done in two ways either by words or by conduct right um brogdon versus metropolitan railways is the case law to show that acceptance could be done through performance as well right okay so let's go through the acceptance other cases i've covered the important cases in whatever i discussed uh, when i was doing offer and all everything else you can just understand so because we are in a time crunch i want to like uh, jot or go th go through like the important areas that are usually confusing students right okay so communication of acceptance as is concept called silence cannot amount to acceptance that's a golden rule the case is uh, felthaus versus binley there was a horse uncle and a son so uncle says look here i am willing to purchase your horse if you are not if you if you want otherwise let me know if you are willing to sell the horse don't tell me right and the guy doesn't uh, the guy is actually willing to sell the horse but he tells his agent and the agent forgets to reserve the horse right so what whatever the again now you will see the whole um objective interpretation also here right now he in, he had his intentions of selling the horse but the court said look here whatever said and done the silence of a person cannot be construed to mean that it's acceptance why it will be detrimental because it will induce parties induce unwilling parties to get into contracts right mata liu mahambu natnang yeah i will be accepting to something i don't want no right so the case of rust versus abby says if it's not detrimental on parties right if both of us if both of us want to sell the horse right 
and but there is some sort of a miscommunication or the silence rule is obstructing us from fulfilling our common objective then you can rely on rust versus abby so long as it's not detrimental to either party and it doesn't induce an unwilling party to an unwilling contract got it okay so um so to say now so acceptance has be has to be communicated right silence doesn't amount to acceptance not only that acceptance has to be communicated to the person who's making the offer if he's making the offer to me i need to communicate it to him look here i'm accepting your offer right entos versus miles fries corporation is the case there are exceptions to it now okay now if it's a unilateral contract guys cardel versus carbolic smoke ball now a person cannot be walking to the building and being like you here i accepted your offer right but i still got the influenza you can't be saying that so he says or rather the court says at a particular point like that what happens is the moment you purchase the smoke ball you purchase the smoke ball knowing that these are the terms these are the conditions that's an offer they made the moment you purchase the smoke ball when you get influenza that is acceptance that is acceptance by performance you don't have to communicate it individually right okay then there is also the uh, rule of postal acceptance so postal acceptance the reason why postal acceptance is there is now this was during like the 1800s no me the snail mail was so slow so now i can send you in send you a, a like a not an email like a snail mail and she would get it like two weeks after right so sometimes it won't it it was to the detriment of the parties right and people thought it was very unfair so the courts developed this particular rule of postal acceptance postal acceptance how it happens is the moment i write a letter to you put in the mailbox right not my gather a mailbox to the state's mailbox that amounts to acceptance right so the date of acceptance is not the date she actually got the letter instead the date i posted it right um now so this is now okay again there are two requirements right the requirements are listed in the case of adams versus linsley right it says postal acceptance when postal acceptance or rather um when communication by post is requested a or stipulated how do you stipulate say that the original offer came by post you stipulate that the acceptance would also be done in a similar way now if the original offer came by email and you resort to snail mail that is your fault right so then in an instance like that postal acceptance won't work you can't rely on it right so there are certain exceptions to the postal acceptance rules as well um so postal rule applies to post and telegrams but not to telephone fax or email so if telephone fax email all of that would be the normal general rule right and uh, there is a case to say that now there are we have this answering machines voice machines and what the, what not when is an unmanned machine uh that is more or less um, without any interference of a human what amounts to as acceptance is um the day or the time where it is reasonably uh where where it could be reasonably contemplated for a person to have gone through it example i think i put it in a very uh, complex manner let me just make it very simple for you all i call a particular office and i say that i accept their offer right so this is this goes to an electronic machine or whatever right so what i can accept so acceptance would be next day during office hours right if i communicate it to them around 12 o'clock right uh, that won't be acceptance even though i've called them even though i've left a message so acceptance would be during office hours tomorrow night i can stipulate ah okay they would listen to it right so that the case is 10x same ship 10x steam ship just google it you get the case also the rule would not be applied or the postal acceptance rule would not be applied when the letter is not properly posted stamps are doing up right when the um when the address of the recipient is not put down right right um or where the offer itself excludes postal acceptance or communication by virtue of post right 
Um, okay. So, method of acceptance, right. So, how do you determine which way to use or which sort of uh, communication to rely on? Again, you can, be, you can stipulate from the original offer or you can rely on postal services so long as you know that it is contemplated by the party or by the person who is making the offer to you. Right? So long as those two elements are uh, okay, you can rely on postal services and you can rely on postal acceptance as well. Alright, so guys, uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for being patient and thank you so much for listening. I'll see you. Bye-bye.